Hello, my name is Ishan. Hello, my name is Pallavi. And, and welcome, welcome to, to Politics, Politics Corner, Corner, your crash course in modern day politics on the international, national, and local stages. Here, we pride ourselves on a moderate and unbiased approach to politics, regardless of our political affiliations, and we hope to encourage our fellow Californians to learn and care about government. Today, we are going to be covering the Supply Chain, the Freedom to Vote Act, and California Senate Bills 9 and 10. Stay tuned. Welcome back, folks, and welcome to the first segment of Politics Corner, International Politics. Today, we are covering the supply chain issues which have riddled the United States and also the rest of the world since 2020. Now, many people may have heard the term supply chain issues thrown around a bit over the last year or so, but many don't even know what that means and that and why it's so important. So, Pallavi, what can you tell me about how the supply chain affects individuals? Well, if your favorite boba tea shop didn't have the ingredients for tapioca pearls at any point this last year, or if a Starbucks you, frequent, uh, you frequented displayed a sign saying supply issues, items may not be available, or your online order took a month and a half to get to you, then you have personally been affected by the United States crumbling trans-Pacific supply chain. That's right. Uh, it may surprise our listeners to hear that their lost products are not all that far away. In fact, they are likely just sitting miles off the California coast, waiting for an open berth at the ports of Los Angeles or Long Beach. Space at the Long Beach docks is so tight that when a slot opened up at 1 a.m., the port pilots wasted no time. They sped off into the dark, and so did we. Following Captain James Dwyer up a rope ladder as he climbed aboard to guide the giant ship, the Ever Lincoln, to an open berth. We're inbound for LA berth 405. Steering the ship through the harbor, he told us pilots are handling twice the usual number of vessels. It turns out docking a ship the size of three football fields is the easy part. How about that? Getting the goods from here to store shelves is proving to be a lot more daunting. So you heard that, but why, you're probably wondering. Why is there such an abnormal traffic jam just off the mainland? Well, why don't we tell you? Uh, the first thing that's important to understand is that the ocean shipping industry is incredibly vulnerable, and that's because it was designed to run perfectly, without interruption. Right. There's a phenomenon called economies of scale. Producing goods in larger batches lowers the unit cost of the goods. In ocean shipping, that means technology must con constantly evolve to accommodate more containers on ships. And on the same line as putting more containers on ships, shipping companies also try to reduce turnaround time as much as possible. Companies like Mayer's Essex use computers to generate floor plans and automatic cranes to implement those plans, all just to minimize the time between a ship docking and the departing again. The cost of a ship, crew, potential revenue, etc., accumulate whether the ship is docked or moving. However, re revenue accumulates only when the con containers are en route. That's right. Uh, cost reduction extends far beyond just the ships, though. Uh, for example, uh, there are only five shipping ports on the entirety of the U.S. West Coast, Seattle, Tacoma, Oakland, Los Angeles, and Long Beach. The ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach are by far the most significant because they are the most used ports on the West Coast of the United States, primarily due to the abundant nearby population and infrastructure. The advents of extreme cost reduction do come at a price, though, and that is that the entire industry runs the extreme risk that they can be easily disrupted by fluctuations in traffic. Fluctuations just like what the Trans-Pacific shipping industry experienced in 2020. In 2020, the world locked themselves at home, hoping to wait out the dangerous pandemic outside. Many American families found themselves with disposable income, but nowhere that they could vacation to. Therefore, several families turned to online stores such as Amazon.com to purchase Chinese manufactured consumer goods, resulting in a 25% increase in Trans-Pacific shipping. In all honesty, late Christmas sweaters and a lack of cinnamon coffee cake won't kill anybody, but a shortage of personal protective equipment and ventilators might. 
That's right. Uh, Donald Trump was a huge proponent of the National Security Defense Argument, or NSDA. Uh, the NSDA is basically an international trade ideology where certain vital goods uh, must be produced domestically so that in a time of war or other crisis, the nation is not dependent on outsiders for survivability. For example, sugar is a restricted item because it is considered a vital good. And because it's re restricted, you pay about $1 more per jar, and several food chains substitute high fructose corn syrup instead. Over the years, many politicians have questioned the effectiveness of the NSDA because of lobbies like the Angora fleece market. I'm glad you brought up that example. Uh, the Angora fleece market is completely American because of congressional lobbying. Uh, technically, they say that it's because Angora fleece is used in Air Force jackets, but we could very easily, even in a time of crisis, substitute another wool or you know, even a synthetic alternative. But because of that lobby, they maintain that protection from international competitors. Joe Biden maintained and extended several of Trump's national security trade policies. Unfortunately, pandemics are not the time for political idealism. As hospital ships docked and intensive care units ballooned in size throughout April in New York, planes were landing at JFK carrying thousands of desperately needed ventilators from China. As hospitals around the world ran out of supplies and required healthcare workers to reuse masks for days or weeks on end, national airlines were making special, dedicated trips to pick up medical supplies donated by China. As every corner of the world worked to ramp up testing to get a more accurate picture of their problems, Chinese-made test kits were streaming through their borders. The United States became dependent on China for ventilators, masks, test kits, and other forms of PPE. Some politicians have claimed that the NSDA is impractical in times of crisis. We disagree. The NSDA is designed to protect the nation during a time of crisis. It will be utterly useless if it only applied in times of prosperity. Growing dependent on other nations for critical items is never advisable, especially during a crisis such as a worldwide pandemic. Now, to Joe Biden's credit, he was wary about relaxing our application of the NSDA and subsequently improved diplomatic relations with China, hoping to ease any tensions that would compromise our supplies. But he did not anticipate a traffic jam off of our own borders to separate us from vital goods. The traffic jam on the West Coast isn't just presenting a bottleneck, however. Rather, it has grown, it, sorry, rather it has thrown the entire shipping industry out of whack. Ports are under pressure to reduce turnaround time, so they've stopped allowing the reloading of empty containers onto ships. Therefore, empty containers are dumped on the American mainland and new ones are being manufactured in Asia, increasing shipping costs. Corporations are under pressure to get their goods into the American mainland, so they pay premiums to get on container ships or turn to air shipping, increasing shipping costs. The average container, which used to ship for $1,500, now ships for just shy of 20000 If you're wondering who bears the brunt of that, it's everybody. Consumers pay more for their products, corporations pay more for shipping and lose revenue, and shipping companies like Mayers Essex experience all-time recessions in profitability. The global economy relies on connectivity, and this is a prime example of how intertwined connection is to prosperity. With hospitals running short of crucial items, consumer prices skyrocketing only to turn profits, and infrastructure developments halted due to material shortages, President Joe Biden finally stepped up to the plate. Los Angeles and Long Beach are home to two of the largest point ports in America, and together these ports are among the largest in the world. After weeks of negotiation and working with my team, the Port of Los Angeles announced today that it's going to be, begin operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This follows the Port of Long Beach's commitment to 24-7 that it announced just weeks ago. 24-7 system, what most of the leading countries in the world already operate on now, except us, until now. This is the first key step toward moving our entire freight, transportation, and logistical supply chain nationwide to a 24-7 system. 
To clarify, Biden's idea was rooted in sound reasoning. Most other major seaports in the world operate 24-7, and statistics show that turnaround times are 25% faster at night in Los Angeles because the highways are less crowded. Unfortunately, port workers are heavily unionized, and they pushed back. The International Longshore and Warehouse Union, or ILWU, representing more than 20,000 workers, declared strikes at the, ports, at the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. These workers have been in a state of negotiations since 2002 over threats of losing their jobs to automatic te technology, and this supply chain crunch has simmered tensions to a boiling point, as exhausted workers claim they are unable to work longer or faster to unload these ships. The U.S. Secretary of Labor Marty Walsh visited the port complex Tuesday to discuss the Biden administration's efforts to mitigate the supply chain crunch. But unfortunately, we just don't know how or when the supply chain will resolve and what the long-term implications of that resolution will be. Very true. It's almost a guarantee, though, that this is not the last we've heard of our supply chain issues. All right, folks, stay tuned because we are going to be covering the Freedom to Vote Act right after this. Welcome back, and welcome to the second segment of Politics Corner, where we are discussing the Freedom to Vote Act. The Freedom to Vote Act is a bill in Congress right now, and there's a lot going around about it. Now, the bill is incredibly relevant, but the reason I think it hasn't had a lot of media attention is because it's not a very polarized issue. Yeah, it really isn't. It has some legitimately decent measures, but also a series of ineffective or even damaging measures. So it's honestly an issue that both left-wing and the right-wing media outlets don't want to touch because they simply can't classify it as this is good, this is bad, this is racist, which seems to be all that the mainstream media is really interested in nowadays. And it makes sense, you know, uh, extremism sells. But Pallavi, what can you tell me? What, what is the Freedom to Vote Act? So the Freedom to Vote Act is the latest in a long line of Democrat proposals to improve voter freedom and voter involvement in the United States. And the reason that it originally sparked up a lot of controversy is because congressional representatives couldn't negotiate or edit the bill to be bipartisan. So instead, it turned into a polar yes or no. All right. So go ahead. Simplify it for our listeners. What are the actual meat and potatoes policies that the Freedom to Vote Act carries? Well, the bill has three goals, stimulate voter involvement, reduce gerrymandering, and reform campaign fi financing. Now, on the first goal, simulating, uh, stimulating voter involvement, the Freedom to Vote Act actually has a series of rather decent policies. Precisely. Uh, for example, the bill advocates for same-day, automatic, and even online voter registration, which presumably will help generate voter involvement by reducing any obstacles that the... Uh, voter registration process typically posed. Right. It also tries to make mail-in voting more common, and it mandates that polling locations be open a full 15 days before Election Day, including weekends. So, Pallavi, I know that there was uh, quite a bit of controversy around mail-in voting. What, what is your stance on that? So you're right. First of all, that there was quite a bit of primarily right-wing opposition to mail-in voting. Most Republicans claimed that mail-in voting would lead to election fraud, but a lot of independent educational studies reaffirmed that mail-in voting poses a negligible, at best, potential for voter fraud. So I am supportive of mail-in ballots. I think it will encourage involvement by both by making it more convenient to vote and allowing people without access to transportation or assistance to access their ballots. I think personally, uh, the hidden fear so to speak, amongst Republicans was that the bill would overall just stimulate involvement with predominantly leftist working class, uh, which would off-put their delicate balance of power. Uh, but that's not entirely true either, because the bill, yes, it will stimulate involvement with the working class, but it would also stimulate involvement with, say, senior citizens who are primarily right-wing. They're trying to protect their assets, their real estate, uh, etc., so what are your thoughts, Pallavi, on the illegalization of photo ID requirements? Absolutely not. Don't. And this is actually one of the pieces of the Freedom to Vote Act that I am staunchly opposed to. Photo IDs maintain our election integrity. Otherwise, people could vote with fake IDs. The IDs that are checked at the polling stations need to be standardized and verifiable. So photo IDs are a must. 
<laughs> Anyways, like I said, there are three goals of the Freedom to Vote Act, and the second one is reducing gerrymandering. Ooh, so gerrymandering is a rather complex issue, but let's try to simplify it. Congressional districts are drawn to split up a state into different sections, from which residents of those districts vote to elect a representative for the House, the lower division of Congress. The problem is, every 10 years when we have a census, there's a pretty good chance that a state might gain or lose one or even more seats because the number of seats your state gets is proportional to your state's population. Remember, the House is proportional to population. The Senate is just two per state. Now, in the likely event that your state's population has shifted a bit in the entire decade, you have to redraw the congressional districts. And there are huge debates about who exactly gets to do that. Even though it might seem irre irrelevant where you draw those lines, you can actually produce reliable and fixed election results by drawing them strategically. The most prevalent technique to skew election results this way is called packing and cracking. Here's Vox to tell you more. The basics of gerrymandering are actually pretty simple. If you're a Republican trying to keep power, you want to do two things. First, pack as many Democratic voters as possible into a single district. If you have a district where almost everyone votes Democrat, that means almost half these votes are basically wasted. You can also crack big Democratic areas into separate districts where there are slightly more Republicans. So even though an area has a lot of Democratic votes, they would actually lose in this district and in this district. These are the two elements of classic gerrymandering, packing and cracking. There are a number of proposed ideas to end gerrymandering, but they're all flawed and imperfect. I think the most common solution we hear about is having independent commissions draw the electoral boundaries. Pallavi, what do you think about that? It's a logical solution to come to, but it's a bit idealistic. How do you determine the true independence of that commission? How do you know that none of the people on that commission have an agenda, personal or business related? You can't. Makes sense. But uh, kind of on the same breath, we also hear about uh, bipartisan committees drawing electoral districts. Why don't I let CGP Gray explain to you why that is problematic, too? The line suggests the obvious solution. A bipartisan committee must agree on all new range boundaries. This seems like a good idea. After all, if both parties have to agree on the ranges, then they must end up being fair to everyone. But after a few election cycles using this solution, Queen Lion notices that she always sees the same faces on the Jungle Council. Representatives almost never get defeated in their elections. It turns out that the interests of the representatives and the interests of the citizens are not the same. Citizens want elections where the candidates have to earn their vote. These are close elections where either candidate has a chance of winning. But representatives don't want close elections, they want safe elections. Elections where they run in a range that is filled with supporters. Because the representatives are in charge of the boundaries, they make the safest ranges possible. So as CGP Gray said there, representatives don't want fair elections, they want safe elections. So even though we might see proportional representation for individual parties, that system won't produce fluid and meaningful elections. Now that said, when I was researching this episode, I found a rather interesting proposal. We set up an algorithm to draw the electoral boundaries fairly. And the most simple example was called the shortest split line method, where you start by drawing a straight line through the state that perfectly divides the state in half. And then you do that again with each new district. Just keep cutting those districts in half until all the boundaries are drawn. Uh, and does that pro pro proposal have opposition? Well, okay, so the biggest concern uh, is that it can still produce skewed election results just through pure chance. But I believe that, that if that algorithm is like publicly available, at least individual citizens uh, can verify that there is no intentional bias, which, I mean, I think that would help uh, restore some faith in our elections. But there are so many more solutions. And if you're interested, you should visit rangevoting.org. Uh, they're a nonprofit organization that focuses on election research and different ways to improve election fairness. Uh, that said, however you may feel about the West's way to solve gerrymandering, the Freedom to Vote Act is not doing anything about it. 
Very true. Politicians have claimed that it will offer more power to states to deal with gerrymandering claims. And aside from that being a terrible idea, because the courts that decide those claims can have agendas, that was already a privilege which the Supreme Court specified when ruling on gerrymandering in North Carolina. So really, this bill doesn't introduce anything new. Why don't we move on to the third aim of the bill, reforming campaign finance. Now, there is one provision of the bill, which is a legitimately great idea, in my opinion, and that is forcing candidates to disclose detailed campaign finance information. Supporters of the bill claim that this will reduce dark money influence, which is when donations can remain anonymous. And I agree. Voters deserve to know who else supports their officials and therefore who those officials will also be representing if elected. To clarify, though, because I've seen this misconception spread, none of that means that corporations or really anybody can't donate to a campaign. It just means that their contributions are public knowledge. However, the Freedom to Vote Act tries to make super PAC or a super political action committee coordination illegal. To help you understand more about super PACs, here is Chi Sun Lee from the Brennan Center. It's true that people have always given to politics, but super PACs have really enabled the supercharging of giving by the extreme wealthy. A super PAC is a legal vehicle for people or businesses or both to pool their wealth to spend on electoral politics through television advertisements, radio ads, and they're a creature of a Supreme Court decision from 2010 called Citizens United. The technical differences between a super PAC and a regular political action committee are really the promise that a super PAC's founders make that its activity is going to be independent of any candidate. And saying that it's going to operate independently frees it from legal contribution limits and legal spending limits so that it can raise as much as it wants to from any American donor or business and spend as much as it wants to on election. Here's a unique thing that we don't see a lot here. Paula V and I actually disagree. I believe that super PACs are super beneficial for politics because they force major party candidates to stay on their toes uh, and they, you know, they, do, they prevent the hyperpolarization of Congress. What do you think? Well, like you said, this is one area where we don't agree. The reason I think that banning super PAC coordination is a good idea is because it allows grassroots candidates to, you know, actually have a chance. A lot of the times, a lot of these super PACs are financed by large corporations whose interests do not align necessarily with the citizens of that of the community. So if you ban them, you know, then everybody has sort of an equal or at least a more even, um, relatively more even playing field. Now, it doesn't you stop corporations from donating. It just stops these large coordinated, you know, movements that, that are set out to serve the interest of corporations. In my opinion, super PACs don't really pose a threat to the integrity of our elections. In Paul V's opinion, they sort of do. I respect, uh, you know, our differences, but I guess the entire purpose of this, like we said, the entire purpose of this podcast is not to tell you how to think, it's to tell you the facts and let you think on your own. So in my opinion, I think the primary thing we should be doing with this act is preventing strangleholds on Congress, on the White House, on any legislature, which, because that is like a pillar of fluid democracy, right? Too true. At least in this, we agree. Anyways, now that you know all about the Freedom to Vote Act, why don't we treat ourselves to some pure partisan propaganda? Is your democracy flaccid? Trouble maintaining a strong coalition? Tired of the parade of disappointing performances? Then you might be one of the 330 million Americans suffering from electile dysfunction. Fortunately, there's the Freedom to Vote Act. The Freedom to Vote Act? What's the Freedom to Vote Act? The Freedom to Vote Act ends your tired, sagging, floppy relationship with politics by making Election Day a holiday across the country, banning gerrymandering, expanding voter access, increasing integrity, blocking foreign interference, empowering everyday citizens, and healing our democracy. Talk to your senator about the Freedom to Vote Act and demand safer and more satisfying elections today. 
aside from how ludicrous it is that they've linked election integrity to erectile dysfunction, it strikes me how brazenly they misrepresent the actual legislation in question. Right. I mean, like uh, banning gerrymandering and ending foreign interference. And really, all of that is just untrue. Uh, just because a bill sets out to do something doesn't mean that it's actually achieved it. I mean, first of all, the issue was never let's make gerrymandering illegal. It was never so simple. The problem was that we couldn't define gerrymandering objectively. So it's like you can make something illegal, but you have to have an objective standard. And also about ending foreign interference. The bill doesn't even address foreign interference. Now, many people are wondering, why are we even discussing this right now? Well, this bill is stalled in Congress right now, and regardless of whether it is passed into legislation or not, we're going to hear more about this. In June, the For the People Act was thrown out. And that bill was starkly similar to the Freedom to Vote Act, which makes me think that this is going to be cycled through Congress again and again, even if it's rejected. So I think that it's really important uh, that the general public truly understand exactly what they would want in their ideal version of it. Because whether this bill gets rejected, approved, we don't know, but it's probably not going to disappear from our purview. All right, well, stay where you are, and we'll be right back to discuss California Senate Bills 9 and 10. See you soon. Welcome back, folks, and welcome to the third segment of Politics Corner, Local News. Today, we're going to discuss California Senate Bills 9 and 10. Ishan? So SB 9 and SB 10 were signed into law by Governor Newsom on September 16th, 2021. These bills were designed to spur development in California and reduce the price of housing. Ishan, tell me, is that the true motivation behind these bills? Absolutely not. <laughs> None of the bill will actually make housing more affordable. In fact, it is it will make housing far more expensive. The nonprofit organization Housing is a Human Right made a video explaining this. California has an affordable housing crisis. These bills will allow developers to tear down single-family homes, especially in communities of color, and replace them with housing only the affluent can afford. SB 9 and SB 10 do not require the development of affordable housing for families who are struggling or homeless. Developers can tear down a single-family home with no say from the local community and put two luxury duplexes in its place. Developers can demolish a single-family home and put a luxury 10-unit apartment complex in its place. Developers can do this over and over again, unchecked, taking over entire neighborhoods with market rate units. Developers will target neighborhoods where the cost of land is low, primarily in communities of color, where they can reap the most profits. They will drive existing homeowners out of their communities to make way for more affluent residents. The only people who will benefit from SB 9 and SB 10 are wealthy developers, Wall Street speculators, and hedge fund companies. Now, you heard it. These two bills are ostensibly intended to ease the state's housing crisis, but in fact, they're extremely harmful. Many housing justice advocates, city governments, and homeowners associations heavily opposed both pieces of legislation, noting that the bill doesn't provide affordable housing and the homeless housing requirements. It will fuel gentrification and it will take away the abilities of communities of color and working class residents to build wealth through home ownership. Instead, it's just yet another multi-billion dollar giveaway to deep-pocketed real estate interests. That's right. Uh, so. SB 9 is primarily about subdivisions, uh, allowing people to subdivide plots really easily, uh, split up their plots into multiple so that they can build several units on each and just kind of treat them separately. And SB 10 is more about zoning. And if you don't know, Cal uh, Governor Newsom talked about this. I believe it was leaked. Uh, don't quote me on that. But what he said was, I wish to get rid of all single family zoning in California. And while SB9 and SB10 won't do that, it definitely tells you where the intentions are. The developers are free to make as much profit as possible. So it really just, you know, benefits. It's going it's to price people out of their own neighborhoods. It's going to price people out of their own neighborhoods. Absolutely. I mean. And what I hated about this bill was that it was actually under the guise of we're going to solve homelessness. Yeah, I mean, the only people it'll benefit, like I said earlier, is either the developers or people who already own property who are now looking at maybe even subdividing their own lot and building additional homes. I disagree. There is one more person that this benefits. 
and I know that you you have a different opinion, but that's okay. There's a reason why this was signed into legislation, and that is because Governor Newsom loves his moolah. He wants more tax revenue. He's like a daddy's girl, and he's just like, I want more money. Give me more money. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the don't even get me started on government misspending and mismanagement of funds in California. Seriously, I mean, what, did you hear about the California exit tax? This this was this is still in legislation right now. Wow. The legality of it is still being pursued, but they want to charge people if they make over thirty thousand dollars a year. Maybe it was three hundred thousand. I don't know the numbers, man. But what they were saying was, if you make us above a certain amount, if you leave California, we will continue to tax you for ten years because you can't just leave to escape taxes. No, that's exactly what you can do. That's called interstate <laughs> commerce. That's what keeps our taxes competitive. Yeah, well, coming back to these bills, uh, as I said, the impact of these two bills is far greater than any housing bill that has been passed in the last two decades. What it used to be was uh, cities and counties, you know, whoever had jurisdiction, depending on the space, they could build whatever they wanted within reason, within certain safety codes and also uh, general housing plans, but also... You know, the appointed commission could do whatever they wanted. They could approve a development. The thing is, ministerial approval basically says, if you meet these standards, we will approve. We're not allowed to say no. Right. Now, local communities no longer have that control to basically say, hey, you know, we don't want all of the, these developers coming in and building, you know, uh, multi-housing units in, in neighborhoods which are primarily single-family owned or they have a more rural appeal. The, the quintessential California as we as we knew it, um, that's going away. And and basically, we don't have control over our communi communities anymore. Pallavi here actually has some very unique experience. In her community, she is a site and architecture commissioner. Uh, and typically, housing developments were something that you would vote on. So tell me, how has SB9 and SB10 uh, changed the way that your job will run? Well, first of all, how SB9 and SB10 is implemented in our community, I can tell you there is severe opposition from the majority of our residents for the concerns that I said. You know, their concerns on parking, on fire safety, on, you know, the congested developments, and basically the lack of control that we have. You know, earlier, um, you know, residents could come in and object to certain developments if they felt that this is going to hamper their way of living. And as a commission, we would basically keep all of that into account. So every new development, is would have to be consistent with the community feel and appeal. Um, we would make sure that the tree, trees are protected. You know, we in, mo, in a lot of the communities in California, we have 150-year-old oak trees, native species. We would do our best to protect them. Now, again, because of this process being ministerial, which means it's basically over the counter, we don't have that control anymore. And, you know, we're in the danger of losing all the great trees that we have and give way to, you know, these developments. And I love how they actually made this seem like it falls in line with a Democratic Party agenda. It so does not. It almost infuriates me when AOC, and this is not in California, but she always likes to tweet and post about how, oh, I was going to COP26 and, uh, you know, Republicans were supposed to come too, but they actually decided to stay back because they're being lobbied and they're going to they're gonna come and represent the corporational interests. Um, you think Republicans are the only ones being lobbied. Why else would this be introduced into legislation? Yeah, I want to make sure that Californians understand this, that these bills are going to impact you in a way that you probably haven't been impacted before by any of the other housing bills. So, you know, if you don't know about them, learn about them, be the voice in your community, uh, you know, raise your objections, write to your congressman. I mean, don't sit by and wait and, and you know, just assume that this isn't going to impact you because because it is already impacting, yeah. you know, your, your, your neighborhoods. And one thing that I want to say, and people might get mad at me for this, but I don't care because we target anything fearlessly here on Politics Corner. Uh, the way that your assembly person or a state senator or a legislator voted on this bill is public knowledge. Please look it up and please take that into account when you are deciding who to reelect next election. Remember, your voice is how you get involved. Get involved in your community, get involved in your state because this is going to affect you every day and this is a perfect example of why we started Politics Corner.
Thank you so much for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you want to get involved in politics, but you don't know where to start or who to trust, then Politics Corner is great for you. We are a free podcast that gives you bite-sized crash courses in modern day politics, how government affects you, and how to get involved. We pride ourselves on being unbiased and moderate with our show to generate political involvement. If you want to hear more from us, follow us on social media or just subscribe. Our next episode will release next Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. I'm Pallavi Sharma. And I'm Ishan Prasad. And And thank thank you for for listening listening to Politics Politics Corner. Corner.